This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin our time of worship together today, we're going to take a little time to stand before God and express our sorrow at our own failures and confess our sins to prepare our hearts to hear His holy word. Let us now prepare to come into the presence of God by taking a little time of silence so we can each make our own individual confession. <clears throat> Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. You may be found just when you speak. And blameless when you judge. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit, that I may teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Anyone who stands with Christ and is born again as a new creation. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be in peace. Amen. As we continue our preparation for God's word, we need to spend some time in prayer together. I'm sure each of you has concerns voice within your heart that you want to lift up to God at this time as we pray I will leave some silent time in the center you may speak those out aloud you may speak them only in the silence of your heart knowing with full confidence that our God hears every prayer spoken or simply silent together let us approach the throne of God's grace holy <clears throat> loving and gracious God. Lord, we give all praise and glory and honor to your name. We are blessed to be able to gather together in worship, give adoration, give glory to you for the marvelous gift of grace that exists within our lives because of the call upon us. We know, Almighty God, that without you we are nothing. We acknowledge that and we praise you for the glory of your creation, the joy of relationship, for the fulfillment of being your children. We have confessed before you this morning, Almighty God, our failings and our shortcomings, and we confess those things with the absolute certainty of your forgiveness for come before you penitent and sorrowful. We have so many things to be thankful for. In this world, so many of us are blessed beyond our own understanding. We need only look around us and understand that not all are as blessed as we are. We give you thanks and praise. Thank you, Lord, for your families. Thank you for our parents, for our mothers, for our fathers. Thank you, Lord God, for the understanding of love that comes to us, particularly from our mothers. We know what unconditional love is, Lord, only because you have brought your agape <coughs> into the world through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have so many things to lay before you. We pray, Lord God, for all those who are suffering, for those who bear the burden of illness, physical, emotional, mental. 
We pray for you to rest your healing hand upon each of these people and to grant them peace. To lift them up from the place of illness to healing and to glory. But we pray for the church that in all ways we shall truly be representative of honoring presence among us as the Christ. We pray, Lord God, for our nation. We are at a point in this nation where there is much division and anger. We pray for the peace of God which surpasses all understanding to settle upon us and to grant us listening ears and open hearts. We pray that the righteousness of your love will guide the decisions being made by all those who govern in this nation. We pray, Lord, for justice and for righteousness. We pray especially for those who <clears throat> stand between us and the vagaries of the world. We pray for all the first responders, our medical personnel, for EMTs, for doctors and nurses, our police officers and firefighters. We pray for every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine who is in charge. We pray, Almighty God, for an outbreak of peace in this world, for an end to warfare and conflict, for those who bring war for evil to be brought up short word by your justice. We pray for you to protect those who are under the threat of destruction and violence. And God, thank you for the words of the prophets for the guidance of the apostles and for the truth of the holy law in which we learn that when you taught us to pray together you taught us to pray using these words our, our father, father which art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven, heaven. Give, give us, us this, this day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning we're going to take a look back to the First Testament, and the Gospels. Second Testament for a couple of weeks now. We're going to step back a little bit and visit for a while with my favorite of the minor prophets, my friend Amos. I'll be reading from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 17. Hear now the word of God. Thus he showed me. Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. And Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and their prophecy, but never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. It is the royal residence. And Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I the son of a prophet. I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophecy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. 
You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Not everybody agrees with me on my assessment of Amos as my favorite minor prophet. He can be a little bit cranky, to put it gently. But think about it. Have you, as a believer, have you ever wanted to give God maybe a suggestion on how he ought to be doing things? I have. I have a list. When I get there, I'm going to run through the list if it gives me time. But it's right at the top of the list. Mosquitoes, why? Yeah. Now, I have questions. I don't have earth-shattering suggestions, maybe. Simple things like the foods that we eat. Why not put all the vitamins and the nutrients, the minerals, and the stuff that tastes good? Stick the cholesterol, stick the fat, put that in spinach, liver. Brussels sprouts, put it over there. And maybe God could do a little better job of distributing the weather. We get nice weather here, 300 out of 365 days a year. Have you ever been in the Midwest? Yeah. You and I have been in Tornado yeah. Alley in Omaha. Yeah. yeah, not that much fun. Midwest doesn't need as much weather as it gets. On the other hand, there are places in the world that are always experiencing drought. How about our entertainment? Why can't the good guys be the winners in sport all the time? What would be so wrong if the Rays or the Pirates had a good season? <laughs> there are other things I would like to suggest to God. I'd like to suggest that if he would reveal himself a little more clearly, things would be a lot easier. I'm a second career pastor. I came to this profession was called somewhat unexpectedly. I had a great career plan. About this point, I would have run by my original plan. I would have been retiring from the Fortune 500 where I was the chief of security or retiring as the chief of a moderately sized police force in somewhat southern town where I could do a lot of trout fishing. And God had a very different plan, but he didn't give me that Paul on Damascus Road. That would have been so nice. No, knock me down, slap me upside my head, and tell me what you want me to do, God. These, I got this. Hey, hey, hey. My wife was this morning, she can tell you for two years. I walked around and went, What? Who? Me? I would ask God questions like, you, you do remember me, right? It would be easier. I know that the Bible says that God's ways are not our ways. He's so hard to predict. And I'll have a good day, and I start thinking to myself, well, God sure is smiling on me. I must be doing all right today. And then before I can turn around, I messed something up so badly. I think I'm never going to find my way out. And I'm thinking, all right, Lord, where are you when I need you? I think God could also use some advice about the kind of people he calls to do his work. Amos is a great example of that. Peter is a good example of that. Jim is a great example of that. God has this thing about calling imperfect people. I have to tell you, when you look through the Bible, you'll see it over and over again. Abraham, imperfect. He once tried to pass off his wife as his sister to protect himself. Moses was a very imperfect person. He killed a man in a fit of anger. Then there's Samson. Look how easily Samson was led astray by a pretty woman greatest king in Israel's history, an adulterer, a murderer, 
surely God could have found somebody better. Jonah. Jonah was fleeing from God because he hated the people. God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach my word. Jonah said, I don't want to talk to those people. And he fled. I didn't mention Peter. I would not have picked Peter. Yeah, he ended up being the rock upon which God built his church. Before that, he was as bendable as a willow reed in the wind. James and John. Always jockeying for pride of place close to Jesus. I would have even had difficulty with Paul. In fact, I'm not sure Paul and I would have gotten along. You ever read, sat down and really read Paul's letters and his writings? He caused all kinds of havoc in the church with some of the things he said. And he could be really tedious making his you know, he talks about the thorn in his flesh. Did he ever tell us what the thorn in his flesh was? Not really. God should consult some of us before he made those choices. And I am sure that the most common response of all the response of all the men and women through the ages of God has called has been just like mine. Who, me? You have got to be kidding. Who am I that God would use me? It's almost as if the surest way to get turned down by God is to be super qualified. Can you imagine a church today, a, a pulpit nominating committee, interviewing Amos for a job? So Amos, let's have a look at your credentials. Famous like credentials. What credentials? Where'd you go to school? What major theologian has influenced your thinking? Where were you first ordained? Name is Canada or theologian. Ordained. I'm a shepherd. By background, I tend the sheep. I trimmed sycamore trees. I haven't really had any formal training. It did work really well as a trimmer of sycamore trees. Does that count? As for theology, I don't know that any one particular person has influenced my thinking, but I've seen people being cheated in your marketplaces. I've seen widows being thrown out of their homes. I've seen children sold for a pair of shoes. And God has told me that this is not right. God has called me to confront the doers of injustice in our society and to proclaim his righteousness. Those are my credentials. The committee's in there going, sycamore trees, righteousness. Well, Amos, uh, we were really looking for someone with a doctorate and perhaps a Scottish accent. And we would prefer a ministry that wasn't really quite so confrontational. Amos would not have made it past the first interview. God just isn't very good at picking the kind of people who represent busy. Let me give you one a little closer to our time. Everybody in the room knows the name Billy Graham, right? Southern graduate of a Bible college. A Baptist, which I can forget close to that myself. There have always been those who criticized Graham's very orthodox theology. There were always those who expressed skepticism about many of those who made decisions for Christ during Graham's crusades. People questioned how many of those people were really trained. Yet you can go into every major city and you can find someone who will tell you that the turning point of his or her life was a Billy Graham crusade or a Billy Graham sermon. Let's try another one on the other end of the theological perspective. One of my theological heroes, and this is going to be odd from a Calvinist Presbyterian, Mother Teresa, a Roman Catholic, 
are being frail, way past the age when she should have been retired. Surely God could find someone younger and in a much more glamorous spot than Calcutta to serve as his example of self-giving, unconditional love. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, who one time was being honored at a world conference being held in Bombay. She was late. Everybody's inside waiting for her. Waiting and waiting. And finally she shows up. What was the delay? As she was walking up the stairs to go into the conference hall, there was a beggar laying on the steps dying. Everyone going to the conference had stepped over, and that's what they do in Bombay. Mother Teresa got two of her sisters, and they picked them up, and they took them to the hospice. How about Dr. Martin Luther King, African-American, like Graham, a Baptist. King's politics were always a little too far to the left for most mainline Christians, and he was by no stretch of the imagination a perfect man. That when he stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial and proclaimed, I have a dream, it was God's dream with which he confronted America. And in that speech, proclaiming God's dream, Martin Luther King changed this nation. Bringing it closer to home, why me? At the time, a 42 year old retired Air Force cop with way too many blessing, blemishes on my record. How does God let things like this happen? What kind of a job profile does he use for selecting the appropriate candidates? There seem to be three characteristics of the kind of people God chooses. First of all, you have got to be willing to lay down your life to pick up Christ's cross. I'm not talking about martyrdom. Although it could happen. I'm talking about laying down your life, your dreams, your deepest desires. As I said, my plan was to be chief of police in Albemarle County, Virginia. If I want to hear God really laugh, tell him the plans. And go through with this. Someone has said, man is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men and women. And that's very true. Are you willing to live your life in the center of God's will? French Foreign Legion has a motto. If I falter, push me. If I stumble, pick me up. If I retreat, shoot me. I suppose that kind of commitment are required in order to be used to God. Will you follow? There was a commencement ceremony going on in a small Midwestern college. During the ceremony, a scholarship medal was to be awarded to the student who maintained the highest grade point average throughout his or her career. <clears throat> when the moment came, the graduates sat expectantly, eager to find out who had won. The envelope was opened, the winner was announced, and after the program had ended, the senior was marching in the in the recession. He came to a row of seats near the back of the auditorium. He stopped briefly by a middle-aged couple who were seated on the aisle. They were obviously quite poor. It seemed obvious from the old-fashioned hand-mended clothes they were wearing. The young man bent down, placed the middle in his mother's hands and kissed her on the cheek. As he stepped back into the line, the mother placed her hand on the big rough hand of her husband and squeezed it. Someone heard her say, it's always worth the cost, isn't it? The radiant faces reflect the joy that their son's success had brought them. Sometimes in order to make good things happen, somebody has to lay down their life. That seems to be the first characteristic God looks for when he chooses his work. There is a second characteristic. God looks for people who are single-minded in their devotion. He cries the person who is well-rounded, a 
person who is pretty good at a lot of things. They're a little put off by people who are almost fanatically devoted to a single cause. And yet, the people God uses are people who are known for their single-minded devotion. television screen is blank. There's a buzz of an alarm clock. A bed lamp goes on, reaches over to shut off the alarm. Man sits up in bed and we hear a solemn voice. The day cannot begin soon enough for a man possessed by a single aim in life. He is compelled by his drive to win. That drive, according to the commercial we're watching, is on winning, being on a winning team of stockbrokers. Man possessed by a single page of life. Those are folks who always excel, whether it's business or if it's medicine or if it's sports. A man or a woman possessed by a single aim. Back to my buddy Amos. Amos had that single minded devotion. His cause was righteousness and justice among the people of Israel. Regardless of how the people of Israel resisted his prophecies, Amos was not deterred. The lion has roared, Amos declared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Anybody here familiar with Dr. Scott Peck? Pretty well-known writer. In one of his books, People to Lie, he writes that one of his most difficult counseling sessions happened with a woman, with a woman he named Charlene in the book. At a crucial point in her counseling, right after she explained that everything in her life seemed to be meaningless, Dr. Peck asked her what the meaning of life was. When she refused to answer, he asked her what the purpose of life was for Christians. We exist for the glory of God. Charlie said in a flat, low monotone, as if she were basically just very solemnly feeding back a catechism, something learned by rote and extracted from her by force. The purpose of our life is to glorify God. Everybody know the question first question, both the larger and shorter catechism, what is the chief end of mankind? Love God, glorify him forever. Well, Dr. Peck responded. There was silence and for a moment. We thought she was going to cry. She said, I can't do that. There is no room in me for that. That would be my death. And with a suddenness that Dr. Peck said, frightened him, she stopped sobbing and started to scream, I don't want to live for God. I will not. I want to live for me. I want to live for my own self. Sad. Not tragic. There are a lot of people who want to live for themselves, not for God. They don't mind dabbling in religion. After all, a little bit is good for you, but they would never dream of focusing everything they have and everything they are on that one magnificent obsession. God calls people who are willing to lay down their own. God calls people who are single-minded in their devotion. And finally, God calls those who understand the difference between the temporal, the now, and the eternal. If we live for today and for today's pleasures alone, then it's understandable we have very little understanding of righteousness and justice. But if indeed there is something more to life, if there is a righteous God who has created the world and who loves it and who seeks the welfare of all of his created people and our willingness to order his life, our life according to his principles is terribly important. A very old woman who went to visit Jacob the baker. She went to ask Jacob some advice, but Jacob was very well known for his wisdom. Listen, young man, she said, I want to ask you a question. I heard you talk about dying, and I'm going to die soon. <clears throat> I have a great deal of money. If you're so smart, why not tell me how I can take it with me? The woman released a wicked little girdle of greed, and Jacob just looked at her. Well, 
She said, well, what can I carry to the other side? Jacob looked at her and said to her, everything of value. Her greed excited, she shouted, how? How can I do it? Jacob said, in your memory. Memory? Memory can't carry wealth. Jacob replied to her, that is because you have already forgotten what is from family. Jacob was right. The only thing we can take with us into the next world is that which does not consist of physical matter. We can take our kindness to the stranger. We can take our love of brothers and sisters and our love of neighbors and our love even of enemies. We can take the Christ we have served with us. It really doesn't matter how smart we are. It doesn't matter how talented we are. It doesn't matter how many degrees we have, how many toys we have in our garage. God is looking for something entirely different. God is looking for people who are willing to lay down their lives, people who are single-minded in their devotion to God, and people who understand the difference between now and eternity. Not an easy passage to preach for us because it ends with questions for all of us. Here's the question How about you? Do you fit God's job program? We don't ever know when or where He's going to reach out say, it's your turn. I need you. But when he does, the wrong answer is who me. The right answer is yes. Thanks be to God. Amen. Are there are some announcements this morning. Uh, yes. You have it? I have them. Okay. The service for Sunday, May 15th, will be a joint service upstairs. We'll be celebrating the graduation of four of uh, the church members as they graduate from high school. And there will be a congregation meal done here after the service. So please come and join the service upstairs and help to congratulate those people. And in this passage, is going to start your next message. Any others? Okay. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you and all those whom you love on this day and forevermore. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Make sure you say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers.